Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this IIEA webinar today. My name is David O'Sullivan. I'm the Director General uh, of the Institute, and I have the honor to be uh, moderating this event. This event is part of our Global Europe project, which is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. This project aims to analyze and communicate to the wider public the debate on the future of Europe, the EU's role in the world, and Ireland's role in the multilateral order, a theme very important to the discussion we're going to have today. We're extremely delighted to be joined today by Marija Petrinovic Burish, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, and Simon Coveney, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence. Uh, the minister will be uh, the incoming chair of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe uh, in the second half of this year. Each of our speakers will address us for about 15 minutes or so, and we will then move into a question and answer session with our audience. I'd like to remind you that today's discussion is on the record. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen, and we should all be fairly familiar with that by now. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come back to them once we move to the question and answer session. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag uh, IIEA. We're also live streaming this morning, this discussion in, so a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. Having finished the housekeeping, let me now uh, introduce uh, Minister Coveney and give him the floor. Simon Coveney, TD, is Ireland's Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence. From May to November, he will chair the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe as part of the Irish Presidency. Mr. Coveney previously held the position of Thornishta, Deputy Prime Minister from 2017 to 2020, and a number of other senior ministers, ministries. He is a former MEP for Ireland South, and he is a TD for Cork Central. Minister, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, uh, David, and um, thanks for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, in you and in Maria, uh, I have the honor of speaking today with the former Secretary General of the European Commission and the current Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Uh, but let me start by uh, quoting a third Secretary General uh, from another vital organization of which Ireland is a proud member. Once at the height of the Cold War, following a debate between the two blocs at the UN, <clears throat> reporters surrounded Secretary General Hag Hammarskjöld uh, pressing for a comment, and the Swedish diplomat was evasive, as Secretary Generals can sometimes be. At length, the reporters grew exasperated at his, uh, at his replies. Uh, could you say at least, one of them demanded, whether the compass points left or right, east or west, and Hammershod uh, paused before replying, it points forward. Today, amidst war in Ukraine, uh, our continent stands at a crossroads. At such times, we should hold our compass close and orientate ourselves by first principles. And Ireland's compass is the multilateral system that we've helped to build over many years. Our first principles are democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Principles first codified on this continent by the Council of Europe and promoted and protected by it still. 50 years ago, Today, uh, Irish people voted to join what has now become the European Union. But a quarter of a century before we did that, we lived and shaped European values. In London, in 1949, we were amongst the 10 original signatories to the statute that created the Council of Europe and the European Convention and Court of Human Rights. It was an Ireland's initiative that a commitment to the pursuit of peace was added to the preamble to the statute. And it's that pursuit of peace and accountability for its violation, which occupies so many people's minds today. Secretary General Burik uh, met my Ukrainian counterpart, Dmitry Kuleba in Kyiv yesterday. Dmitry uh, was an ambassador to the council and is a firm believer in its values. Last month, I too visited Kyiv and Bucha at his invitation. Together, we saw the truth of what the Kremlin still calls its special operation. 
through rubble streets, we walked a flattened, blackened city. We stood by trenches in which hundreds of innocents lay buried and listened to those who had survived the onslaught. Mere months ago, the idea of such carnage unfolding on our continent seemed not only unthinkable, but virtually impossible, but no longer. And the world has changed utterly, and we are at a turning point, whether we like it or not. On the 20th of May, at this point of profound challenge for our continent, Ireland takes the helm of the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers for a seventh time. In the same month, we celebrate our 50th anniversary uh, as an EU member. In the same year, we serve on the UN Security Council. We are honored to steer an institution that inspires uh, not with examples of power, but with the power of example. The Council and Court have long served as the conscience of Europe. And across our six month presidency term, our goal working with the Secretary General and her team is to reaffirm that conscience. As presidency, we will strive to serve the council as it adjusts to the expulsion of one of its largest members and as it refocuses its resources to respond to the plight of another. Within this context, context we will pursue three clear complementary priorities. Let me consider them in turn. The first is our founding freedoms. We will use our mandate to reaffirm the Council's founding freedoms, renewing our focus on the protection of vulnerable citizens uh, through the effective functioning of the European Court of Human Rights. The Court is where the conscience of Europe truly lies. We were the first state to accept its jurisdiction, and we've always abided by it. Through the decades, we've had our share of judgments. Some were historic. Several were, at their time, contentious but all were respected. Accepting our state was in the wrong wasn't always easy for governments. It's not easy for others today, but it is always right. Because a ruling ignored is a human right infringed. That's how it works. And if we're selective in applying the rule of law, rest assured before long, lawlessness will become the rule. And by protecting individuals' rights, the judgments made by the court, the standards set by the council uh, spurred our state to reform and our society to evolve. We need to look only at the case of Senator da that David Norris took uh, to the European Court of Human Rights in 1988, which resulted in the decriminalization of homosexuality in Ireland. The joy our nation shared when the marriage equality referendum passed so resoundingly in 2016 can be traced to that Strasbourg courtroom, to the bravery of Senator Norris, to the barrister who represented him, our future president, Mary Robinson, to the wisdom of the judges on that bench, to the principles of the convention they are bound to interpret, and we are committed to uphold. I'm here today to speak of Strasbourg, not Stormont, but of course the convention forms a foundational part of the Good Friday Agreement also, and in the wake of the troubles, the human rights obligations it guarantees were crucial in building and bolstering public confidence in policing and political structures across Northern Ireland. They remain so today. So let's be clear, under the Good Friday Agreement, the protections guaranteed uh, the people of Northern Ireland by the European Convention and Court of Human Rights must be retained and cannot by, be diluted in any way. The second area that we're going to focus on, uh, we call Hear Our Voices. In January, we marked the centenary of our state's independence. We understand how hard the struggle for democracy can be and how being uh, an act rather than a state, uh, it must be renewed by each successive generation. Our second presidency priority is rooted in an abiding belief in the power of deliberative democracy and the necessity of youth participation. The Council of Europe has long held uh, in promoting the rights of children and youth, pioneering vital training and inclusion programs across the continent is essential. Through our term, Ireland will draw on its expertise to engage with and listen to young voices. They are the future of our democracies after all. 
in the face of rising illiberalization, uh, we will draw from our national experience, above all with citizens' assemblies, to promote participatory, participatory democracy. And we will look to learn ourselves from others, recognizing the Council of Europe's critical role in setting standards that steer us along the path of pro progress. The third area is Falcha, and those of you who are Irish will know what that means, and those of you who don't will soon know what it means. It means welcome. Under the Irish term Falcha, our final priority will draw upon the changes our society has undergone since Ireland last held the presidency in 2000, as we seek to foster a Europe of welcome, inclusion, and diversity. We now face the largest refugee crisis Europe has witnessed since the Second World War. Already more people have fled Ukraine since February than live in our entire state. The Council and its conventions affirm why we need to play our part in responding. But for the Irish people, this goes beyond politics or principle. Our collective cultural memory understands what it means to be forced from home. To arrive in distant lands carrying little more than the clothes on your back. For us then, Falcha is less a greeting, perhaps a creed. Already, we've welcomed over 30,000 Ukrainians to our shores. We'll continue, I know, for however long it is needed. But we recognize also the great challenges that those tremendous flows of vulnerable, fragile people present to politics across Europe. And the need for states to work with and learn from each other to protect all those who have sought, uh, who have sought shelter uh, is an essential part in what we, need, we all need to do together. To further these three priorities, Ireland will make additional voluntary contributions of almost 1 million euros to the Council this year. Across our six month term, we will chair more than a dozen meetings of the Committee of Ministers in Strasbourg. We'll convene more than 30 conferences and seminars uh, across Ireland. Uh, we'll invite the continent's justice ministers to Dublin to strengthen European standards on combating domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. We will gather scholars and policymakers to Galway to chart a path to enforce the European Convention on Human Rights in areas of protracted conflict. We will do all this and more, conscious of the great challenges facing our country, our continent and our Council of Europe today, but fully dedicated to addressing them together. And determined that over our busy six month presidency term, our compass, Europe's conscience, shall point not left or right or east or west, but forward in the right direction. So I look forward to your, to your questions and your comments. And more importantly, I look forward to the next six months when I hope Ireland will be able to provide both energy and leadership to the work of the Council of Europe at a time when it's more needed than ever. Thank you very much, Minister, for setting out those clear Irish priorities for the presidency, which are directly relevant to the, the tragic situation in which Europe finds itself today. Um, I will now like to introduce uh, our next speaker, Marija Petrinovic Buric, who is the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Prior to holding this post, she served as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign and European Affairs of Croatia. And in that capacity, she chaired in her turn the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe during the Croatian presidency from May to November uh, 2018. Um, Secretary General, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, the uh, Minister, dear Simon. It's really a great pleasure to have the conversation as uh, Ireland prepares for the presidency of the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers. It was also good to be in Dublin just last week. Uh, I had meetings with uh, President Higgins, uh, with you and other ministers, and with members of the Irish delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly. And all of these uh, were positive and upbeat. It is clear that Ireland attaches importance to this presidency and that everyone is determined it should, be, it should make an impact at this very crucial time for Europe. This approach is long-standing. Ireland is, of course, uh, one of the Council of Europe's 10 founding members, as it was already said. 
and throughout the organization's 73 years history, it has been an advocate for multilateralism and that we uh, uh, at the Council of Europe represent. Today, it plays an active role in protecting and promoting human rights, democracy, and the rule of law across our common legal space. In the good times and in the more challenging moments. And certainly we are in one of those moments now. Russia's ongoing aggression on, in Ukraine continues to inflict uh, terrible harm, as I could have witnessed yesterday. Stories of rape, torture, and indiscriminating killing are shocking and appalling. And our hearts are filled with sorrow for the Ukrainian people. Few of us imagined that in the year 2022, a Council of Europe member state would inflict such violent injustice on another. So our committee of ministers was right to expel the Russian Federation from our organization last March. It was clear from the beginning that the aggression against Ukraine was a flagrant violation of our statute, a clear fracture of the values that we exist to uphold, and something that we cannot accept from a member state. Our immediate priority is to do what we can to support Ukraine. This includes amending our action plan of measures on the grounds there, to take account of the current realities. And I have established an expert advisory group to support the, the Office of the Prosecutor General, providing strategic advice as part of the process of investigating gross human rights violations in the context of the current aggression. And we will be ready to provide what help we can within the terms of our mandates. When the violence is over, a 50 million euro package has been put together for that purpose. Next week, our foreign ministers will gather in Turin for a ministerial session. Among other things, they will have the opportunity to endorse our changes to this action plan and to again recognize that multilateralism remains the only means to build a future of peace, security, and cohesion in Europe. Reconfirming their determination to ensure that the Council of Europe remains the benchmark for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in Europe. Throughout the following months, there will be no doubt further developments in Ukraine. Where these concerns are role, we will be sure to respond. And the Irish presidency will play a central role in ensuring that we move forward united. This was not an issue that you would have anticipated just a few months ago, uh, the foreign minister, but it is the harsh reality of where we are today. And I'm impressed by the way in which you have placed, placed it uh, at the heart of the ambitious priorities that you have set out. You are right to place a focus on our founding freedoms, reinforcing human rights and the protection of civilians in Europe. And right also to recognize the spectrum of what this means. Ensuring from protecting individuals' rights in conflict are areas like Ukraine, but also in frozen conflicts throughout our continent. Through the tackling that the violence against women and girls, which continue to blight the lives of so many people who are forced to live in fear. I'm also very interested in, by your choice of promoting participatory democracy and youth engagement as a theme. Democracy is in distress on our continent and beyond. So it is critically important that we discuss ways in which we can strengthen people's involvement and their attachment.
to democratic processes. On this, I think we will certainly benefit from insights from the Irish experience, citizens' assemblies, citizens' engagement, and the promotion of the rights of children and youth. On this, I'm pleased that you intend to advance the implementation of the Council of Europe's strategy for the rights of the child. And interested by the Global Forum on Democratic Missions of Higher Education, which will be hosted in Dublin City University. Taken together, these initiatives and others will give all of us a greater, great, greater understanding of how we can invest in our democratic future. Finally, your decision to prioritize a Europe of welcome, inclusion and diversity is also highly relevant to the times. In recent weeks, millions of Ukrainians have fled their homes, seeking safety in other European countries. And many of those countries are going to great lengths to accommodate and support them. This is good, but not always easy. And we are working with our member states to provide the help and support that they need to uphold the human rights of those who arrive. The issue will be live, live through, throughout the Irish presidency, but so too will other matters that you have flagged, among them combating racism, LGBTI plus rights and human rights and the environment, on which the com committee of ministers is scheduled to adopt a recommendation a process in which Ireland's guidance will be crucial. It is important to say that all of these key issues fit the strategic framework of the Council of Europe. This lays out the organization's priorities for a four year period. The themes and innovative events that you propose will provide further drive and energy in achieving our objectives. And I would like to finish by saying how greatly I appreciate this event too. It is a real sign of your commitment, of course, but it also helps get the message out there about what the Council of Europe will do under the Irish presidency and beyond. A future defined by human rights, democracy, and the rule of law is the best future for Europe. Recent events have demonstrated the terrible alternative. And we should say that openly and loudly for all to hear. So I look forward to working with you and wish the Irish presidency every success. And I look forward also to the questions that we may have from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General, uh, for that uh, presentation of the, the work of the, uh, of the Council. Um, I'd like to ask you both, maybe just following on from the, the, the three priorities which the Minister has outlined and, and which you have commented upon, Secretary General, just quickly to, to run through them again, um, on, on taking the question of human rights, could you describe, Secretary General, in a little bit more detail uh, how the, the Council of Europe will uh, address the issue of human rights violations in the context of uh, the, the war in Ukraine. And I think we're all deeply concerned about, about what is happening. It's a priority of the presidency. Can you explain the, the sort of mechanics of, of how it works from, from the Council of Europe side? And perhaps then, Minister, you might like to comment on, on how the, the Irish presidency would, would want to take that work forward. Well, this was uh, actually one of the first things that uh, I was asked uh, by the uh, Prosecutor General, Madam Benediktova, the Prosecutor General of Ukraine. While the war uh, started, she was already early March calling uh, by a, a video conference and asking for expert assistance in advising on how to collect, how to uh, document, 
and how to uh, uh, to keep uh, the um, the evidence of the gross human rights uh, violations. So immediately, uh, my director general was to meet uh, was meeting with the, with the, with the prosecutor general, and since then we have. Uh, an expert group advising her on these uh, important matters. I know that as unfortunately the situation on the ground is appalling, shocking, and uh, apparently also our uh, human rights commissioner was there for the whole week last week and she will come up with some in some future for, with, with a report on, on, on these uh, human rights violations that she have uh, heard the uh, testimonies from. Uh, so uh, there are uh, already evidences that uh, terrible things have happened and still are happening. Uh, so uh, we will certainly need to, to engage more with Ukraine in that respect. So I also called, we had uh, just last week, the conference of prosecutors general in under the uh, Italian presidency in Palermo uh, and uh, prosecutor general Venedictova addressed uh, the, the conference. So she was calling actually for to all prosecutors general uh, to assist her in uh, the best possible way in order to do that job. Because I think what is very important uh, why these uh, gross uh, human rights violations happen that the perpetrators can be traced and brought to justice, be it uh, uh, the national uh, judicial uh, instances or, or international uh, uh, tri tribunals. So uh, I think what, it, what we can best do while we see these uh, horrible crimes happening is uh, to assist uh, that those who commit uh, these crimes uh, are should be brought to justice. So this is the very immediate uh, uh, assistance that uh, Council of Europe uh, could do, and I think in the future we can see, because I know that ICC, the International Criminal Court, has already uh, been in Ukraine, and uh, it uh, can, um, um, in, in its mandate, is to prosecute certain um, crimes, uh, their ideas also to a little bit enlarge uh, the uh, some crimes, like crime of aggression, but for that, I think international uh, instances yet not have not yet uh, announced or how to do that, but that might also come up in the future. Our parliamentary assembly has addressed that in one resolution in its meeting uh, last last month, and now uh, it is it will be uh, for the member states, but also for the larger uh, international community to reflect. Uh, what sort, sort of uh, international instance would it be only ICC or also some others uh, to uh, to start uh, also working uh, on, on this issue uh, while we have evidently um, gross uh, human rights uh, uh, violations happening in Ukraine. Yeah, David, would you like I, to respond? Yeah, I mean, just on that issue, I mean, I, I, um, so... Um, I mean, quite a number of the countries on the Council of Europe are already involved with working with the with the International Criminal Court uh, in terms of funding the gathering of evidence, uh, documenting evidence. Um, so when I was in Kyiv, uh, actually the day before I was there, Karim Khan was there, who's the chief prosecutor for the ICC. Um, we announced um, funding of three million euros while we were there. Um, actually, not just for their work in Ukraine, but but, but, but certainly for that too, um, um, so that we can ensure that even though the prospect of taking a case uh, in front of a judge uh, of war crimes and crimes against humanity may seem like a remote uh, uh, prospect right now, uh, to actually build up the evidence base and to have the evidence file gathered and in place uh, is, is, I think, really important. Um, and so the, uh, the chief prosecutor in, in Kyiv has been working with uh, Krim Khan and his team. And, um, you know, Ireland, along with another 39 countries, I think, referred the case to the ICC initially. So I'm certainly going to be very interested in seeing how we can build more consensus across um, the, the countries within the, uh, uh, the Council of Europe around supporting that process and actually then looking at how and what kind of structure may be suitable for the crimes that are being committed that are outside of the, the jurisdiction of the ICC. So we know that the ICC can do and should be doing, because it's their role, um, uh, uh, 
uh, taking cases against countries that are being accused uh, of crimes against humanity or, uh, or war crimes. What they can't do is, is take a case against a country for aggression, um, which, uh, uh, which would need a, an independent tribunal type structure uh, to be set up to actually have hearings around. And I think that is the kind of uh, the kind of structure and debate and consideration that the Council of Europe could look at. I mean, it is, after all, an organization whose raison d'etre is about protecting people's human rights, protecting vulnerable people from aggression, um, and holding states uh, and state actors to account. Um, and if there was ever a, a uh, an example of of all of that uh, coming together in terms of accountability and responsibility. I think the war in Ukraine is a very good example of that. So, you know, I think that is something that certainly I'd like to, to discuss with other ministers and with, with Maria as well, because uh, I know there's been some discussion on it, but there are dangers here that, that different ent entities will look at sort of duplicating effort. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things I think we need to do in terms of uh, having international hearings around the crime of aggression in terms of the waging war against Ukraine and its people is that we've got to try to build as much consensus as we possibly can around how that might be done, what would be credible and fair in terms of a hearing system and consistent with international law. We know the ICC can't do that particular piece of work. Um, so it's perhaps something that we could we could get, um, get the legal team uh, that advised the Council of Europe to, to look at. Uh, and try to build some consensus around over the next six months. Thank you both very much. Um, we have a question from Andrew Ford, who's a member of the uh, IAEA's Young Professional Network, a question for Secretary General Burish. And the question is, are there opportunities for the Council of Europe to work with democratic forces in Russia and perhaps Belarus as was committed to by the Committee of Ministers last month, and how might that engagement, how, what is that engagement likely to look like? Thank you, thank you very much for that, because uh, coming back from Kyiv just this morning, uh, uh, actually one cannot then think about the whole, why uh, this terrible war happened and uh, how we can engage with, uh, with those who are still uh, existing democratic forces in Russian Federation in Belarus. And actually when, uh, after the decision of uh, expulsion and the only right one at that moment has been taken by the committee of ministers, we immediately say we, we need to think about engaging uh, with, uh, uh, with, with the democratic forces. Now, the situation is a little bit different for between uh, the situation uh, in Russian Federation at the moment and Belarus. Belarus has not been or is not a member of, um, uh, of the Council of Europe for obvious reasons. It still has uh, capital punishment. And although we try to work for over the years with the civil society and also with the government in order to, to come to, to a point where they will abolish uh, the death penalty and also come uh, more, demo as, more as democratic society, which it, it didn't happen, probably the opposite uh, on, their, on that side. But so far, we couldn't engage with, uh, directly with, uh, with the opposition. Now the Committee of Ministers has taken a decision that for the time being, because Belarus uh, been also used used as a territory from which um, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, was attacked and also uh, allegedly some, some other um, uh, things were happening for, uh, for, from, 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 from Belarus. Uh, the Committee of Ministers decided uh, to uh, suspend all relations that we already had at a very, very low level or almost non-existing and formally uh, 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 turn our relation to democratic um, opposition, which is mostly outside of the Belarus. So I'm looking forward. I know that the, the, the Parliamentary Assembly is uh, um, planning to invite, uh, uh, and also probably the, uh, the Committee of Ministers, Madame Tikhanouskaya, with whom I was uh, in, in, in contact already in one of the future sessions. So that would be certainly a way, uh, a way forward. Now for Russian Federation, 
is, uh, is a bit more complicated in the sense that Russian Federation since, since uh, the start of the aggression on Ukraine has harshened uh, the, uh, uh, the human rights uh, and also some legislation uh, in uh, internal legislation in, in Russian Federation. For instance, at this moment, uh, Council of Europe is uh, treated as a foreign agent uh, according to their law, because if we were to fund a euro to any of, uh, hum of NGOs or, or human rights defenders, uh, uh, they are treated as a foreign agent and we as provider of uh, such assistance would, would be the one. So uh, we, uh, the committee of ministers decided to reflect a little bit how to uh, construct the this type of relation with Russian uh, democratic uh, forces without uh, putting them in a danger of possibly uh, being put in jail or or, 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 or have uh, suffered other, otherwise. But we have clear uh, clear will and clear um, uh, strong co commitment uh, to work with forces in both countries, in Belarus and in, in, in Russian Federation, because uh, what we believe is that certainly we need always uh, to strengthen uh, and, and, and work with those who are willing to, uh, to engage uh, with the values and standards that we promote. So there will be, I'm sure, during the Irish presidency, a possibility to have exchange with these people. We already are engaged with some in some dialogue with, uh, with both Russian and Belarusian uh, democratic forces. And I hope that during the Irish presidency, we will shape uh, more concretely the way uh, and strengthen these relations. Thank you, Minister. This is related, of course, to your very much to your second priority for the, for the presidency. Would you like to Would you like to comment? Yeah, no, I mean, look, we've, we've um, uh, within the European Union, there's, al there's already quite a lot of dialogue, particularly with, the, with, with opposition forces in Belarus uh, for quite some time. I mean, every, um, you know, a couple of times a year, we have breakfast briefings and meetings before Foreign Affairs Council meetings with, uh, with civil society groups, with opposition uh, groups and so on, in particular on the Belarus issue. Uh, obviously, since the war in Ukraine began, that has kind of dominated everything. Um, but but I'd be really interested to see how we can use the the Council of Europe structures to uh, to create a platform for civil society, for democratic uh, leaders and forces uh, uh, from either Russia or or Belarus to actually help them get their message across and to to ensure that um, that they have as much credibility as possible because. Um, you know, in some ways, um, this war, um, uh, uh, while there hasn't been a lot of focus on Belarus, uh, is is impacting hugely on on Belarus's fight for democratic change as well. Um, so I I think um, one of the things we can do is we can invite briefers from civil society organisations and, uh, when appropriate, um, um, you know, opposition politicians as well um, to to ensure that that everybody understands that there are other perspectives in both Russia and in Belarus, even if they are at times brutally put down or threatened or intimidated uh, by long prison sentences and or worse. Um, um, but they are they are brave people uh, that are trying to bring about uh, legitimate democratic change for the better. Uh, often inspired by the European Union and indeed other countries in the Council of Europe, um, and uh, and I think we need to we need to look for ways in which we can give them a platform uh, and support what they're doing, um, uh, which is you know it's happening anyway. But I think it would be interesting to see how the how the, the Council of Europe could um, could could contribute to that positively. Thank you very much. I have another question here from Peter Gunning, a former Irish ambassador to the Council of Europe. Uh, Peter says, it is a matter of regret that Russia's actions have led to its expulsion. This removes the convention's protection from its citizens. What can the Council of Europe and its member states do to counter trends in some states towards reducing respect for and implementation of the court's judgments? Uh, well, actually, uh, Russian Federation was expulsed for the reasons I, I, I clearly uh, explained and uh, 
former uh, ambassador would, would, would know that the statute is very clear on uh, when uh, the blatant violation of the statute happens that we, we, we couldn't act differently. We first suspended, uh, but it was clear that suspension was uh, not leading uh, to change the behavior and uh, stopping aggression in Russia. Uh, now, once uh, uh, the Russian Federation was uh, expulsed and that was uh, the 16th of March, uh, uh, the convention, uh, um, uh, 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 Russian Federation cannot be any longer the member of the European Convention of Human Rights. However, uh, the convention uh, provision is that uh, uh, six months after uh, it will be, be uh, uh, party to uh, the ECHR. So that means that until the 16th of September, whatever uh, violation of, uh, of the convention happens in that time, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the cases can be brought before the court. So already we have this span of six, six months. And of course, we have another uh, issue, which is very important, uh, Russian cases, so-called Russian cases in the court are quarter of all cases. So it's about, uh, there has been, I think at the moment where Russia was exposed to 18,000. Uh, so there might be more in times to come. Uh, the court needs to decide now, it will deal with, uh, with these cases, but it will, uh, we will see, uh, the court will decide the, the manner in which they will tackle such a huge uh, number of cases. And uh, uh, so there will be then issue of implement execution of these judgments. So the committee of ministers will continue, although Russian Federation is exposed to, uh, to monitor the execution of judgments. And that is done by the committee of ministers four times a year in the, in the format called human rights. So there will be, a, 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 let's say a framework still for, uh, for, for implementing uh, the uh, the convention but one in one thing the ambassador Ganning is is is, is right uh, russia is now the third country and uh, um, uh, the uh, the 140 million russian citizens uh, will after the 16th of september will no longer be protected uh, by the convention so uh, the only uh, let's say a good part of it is that uh, uh, we, uh, according to international law, uh, they are obliged to implement, to execute the judgment. So uh, when the court will deal with all those cases, uh, Russia would, uh, Russia would be, uh, should be uh, uh, executing them. Now the matter is how much leverage uh, we would have, but a committee of ministers will certainly continue to, to monitor the execution of all judgments that are pending. Minister? Yeah, I mean, look, ideally you never want any country to be expelled from an organization like this, which is about trying to guarantee common standards um, um, uh, in law across multiple jurisdictions uh, in terms of protecting people's human rights. Um, and it's even more regrettable that Russia, the, you know, the largest state, uh, uh, well, physically the largest state in the world, but, but the, the largest uh, state in the, in the Council of Europe, um, uh, having to suspend and then expel Russia while, of course, it is possible to continue to take cases against them, and that will happen right up until mid-September, um, you know, the, the medium-term outlook now for the Council of Europe's ability to impact uh, on policy development and state actors in Russia is going to be weakened because they will be outside of the fold. Um, but unfortunately, because of what Russia did, I think the, the Council of Europe had no other choice. Um, just like other organizations that have effectively expelled Russia now uh, really didn't have any other choice either, uh, whether it's the Human Rights Council or, you know, or other entities um, that are discussing the same. So, um, you know, that is what a blatant disregard for international law and the brutal, brutalizing of civilian populations uh, when you wage a war against your neighbor results in. You know, and, uh, you know, I think that Russia has got to be isolated. There's got to be a significant cost for the continuation of this war. 
uh, if we are serious about trying to find a way of bringing it to an end uh, uh, as quickly as possible. But, um, but you know, the, 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 um, there's no point in, in pretending that the expulsion is a good thing. It's not. But there was no other, there was no other course of action, I think, available to the, to the Council of Europe. They made a decision um, uh, on the basis of the evidence in front of them, and I don't think there was any other, any other choice. And um, uh, I think the relevance now of the Council of Europe in the context of the war in Ukraine is about some of the things we've already discussed around accountability, the application of international law, how can the Council of Europe impact on the protection of uh, citizens and civilians in, in Ukraine uh, in the context of, uh, of Russian actions. Um, and so in that way, I think uh, the Council of Europe can, can pressurize Russia, but, but it's, um, you know, it's hugely frustrating for you know, civil rights activists or civil society groups in Russia who would have looked to the Council of Europe uh, as, a, uh, as a standard setter, if you like, um, um, and a, an option in terms of taking cases to court and so on that, that could put Russia uh, and policymakers there under pressure. That's not going to be available to them now in the future, and that's that's a that's a huge issue. But I think because of what's happening in the immediate, and it and because of how dramatic it is, uh, I think um, I think the Council of Europe has has acted appropriate appropriately, and it's done all it can do in the face of um, you know of a war that, let's face it, not not many of us expected or predicted. Indeed, indeed. Um, Turning to your, the, the, the third Irish priority, Fulcher, um, Minister uh, Kieran Fitzgerald, uh, a researcher here at the IIA, has the following question about refugees, which I address to both of you. Uh, picking up on the idea of welcoming, Europe's welcome of Ukrainian refugees has provoked questions about its previous treatment of refugees, for example, from Syria. Uh, some European governments have recently sought to return Syrian refugees to Damascus, would either of you care to comment on the perceived uh, um, difference in treatment and whether the war in Ukraine has initiated a change in the international community's approach towards refugees more generally? Not an easy question, I, I, I recognize. Well, I'll give, I'll give Maria a couple of minutes there to think about the answer, because that, that's yeah. a good question. Um, I mean, look, what I would say is that, um, um, you know, there aren't too many positives from this war um, and there are so many negatives but but one of the positives has been um, the sort of galvanizing effect of of this war on you know political decision making within the European Union and I can only speak for the European Union I can't speak to the Council of Europe at this stage um, um, but certainly within the European Union the most contentious political issue for the last six or seven years has been migration uh, refugees uh, and the movement of people uh, into the European Union from North Africa, from the Middle East, um, uh, and from other parts of the world. Um, and any time this issue was debated, uh, it was deeply divisive. Uh, and any time the Commission tried to bring forward proposals, it was nearly always blocked uh, by either a group of countries uh, or, um, well, rarely one country, mainly a group of countries. And there was, let's face it, an east-west divide um uh in terms of perspectives uh, in this area um yes within 48 hours uh the european union effectively agreed to literally open its doors to to all ukrainians and all people coming from ukraine ukraine even if they're not ukrainian uh who are fleeing conflict uh with no visa requirements no quotas um no restrictions um and so far five and a half million people have made that journey um, uh, just under 30,000 have made the journey to Ireland. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, uh, I think it has shown a capacity within the European Union to, uh, to be remarkably generous in the context of solidarity. I think in truth, many countries, um, Ireland not included, but many countries, I think for many countries, this war brought back really horrible memories. Uh, of Russian military aggression, uh, tanks on the streets. Um, and, and so the solidarity and the outpouring of support has really been quite remarkable, uh, particularly in Poland, uh, but also, um, you know, Slovakia, Romania, uh, Hungary, 
um, you know, countries that would have been had very, very firm views on migration uh, and uh, and refugees, um, you know, I think have have shown remarkable generosity and and resilience given given the pressures that their systems are under. That poses the question, you know, why haven't we done that for others fleeing conflict, like in Syria, for example? Um, and I think the honest answer to that is that uh, when this happens on our own continent, when it's happening in with our own neighbor, because uh, Ukraine borders four EU member states, then I think the, the solidarity has been uh, much, much stronger. Um, um, uh, and I think maybe we need to reflect on that uh, because whether you're Syrian or whether you're Ukrainian, if you're fleeing from a city that's been, uh, uh, you know, that's been, you know, reduced to rubble, um, you know, the fears and the anxieties and the trauma is equally strong in both cases, as it is indeed in other parts of the world. Um, but I think, I think there is a, a sense that this is a European conflict that Europe needs to be to the fore in responding to. Uh, whether that is offering military support to Ukraine, uh, whether it's humanitarian support, whether it's accommodating. Um, I mean, many Ukrainians don't want to be called refugees, and I can understand that. They regard themselves as displaced people internationally, as opposed to the formal definition, legal definition of refugee. But, um, but either way, I think the, the solidarity, because it is in the heart of Europe that this is happening in, and there's a European ownership, I think, of the solutions. Um, it has resulted in a in a very very different response to, for example, the um, uh, and of course there aren't any sort of transit countries either here. I mean, with the exception, I suppose, of Moldova. But um, but you know, even with Moldova, there's extraordinary solidarity as well in terms of helping them to cope with um, with the numbers of people. So you know, I think um, you know I can understand that differentiation, although in international law. There probably isn't any distinction uh, in terms of where you come from, um, but I think I, I certainly hope anyway that in the aftermath of this war, uh, it will be easier to build consensus around how we deal with uh, refugees from from conflicts in different parts of the world in the future. Um, given the scale of what we've been trying to accommodate over the last three months and what's likely, un unfortunately, to be uh, a significant challenge for um, you know many months to come. Yes, indeed. I'm sure we all hope that the European Union, at least, will draw some some lessons from that experience, as you as you suggest. Secretary General, would you like to comment? Well, I need to be short because I need to a, 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 a plane to catch. But let me just continue to what Simon just said to apply uh, on the Council of Europe side. So whether you are from Syria or Ukraine or from elsewhere, uh, when entering the Council of Europe legal space, you are protected. Uh, by the European Convention of Human Rights. So this is certainly the position uh, that we have. And now, uh, I also can only share the, the view that this terrible crisis and this uh, the most, the biggest uh, actually refugee crisis after the Second World War in terms of numbers and, and the timing in which it happened uh, really needed solidarity and generosity that was given by a number of Council of Europe member states, especially the neighboring, but also all the other, including Ireland. So I hope also that uh, this will actually also uh, change a li little bit uh, an approach uh, uh, in all of our member states uh, to, uh, to the issue of uh, migration, which certainly is an important issue with quite a lot of consequences. In our system, we have several um, uh, layers on which we work with migration. I have special representative on, on, um, on refugees and migrants. We have a Council of Europe Bank that, for instance, in Ukrainian case was very quick to give a grant of 5 million uh, euros of immediate help and Ukraine is not a member of the bank. Uh, and also uh, recently issued a bond of uh, 1 billion uh, euros for seven years uh, to assist the, 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 the members of the, of the, of the bank uh, uh, next seven years to deal with the social inclusion and other, other issues. Uh, and also we have uh, our Commissioner for Human Rights who has been one of the first to visit uh, the countries that had 
been hardest hit with with refugees uh, 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 coming, uh, trying to assist uh, how to apply human rights standards, uh, uh, tr how to uh, avoid uh, trafficking in human beings, which is all, all often linked with uh, with refugee crisis. We have our committee of uh, CPT committee against torture to see that people do not end in situations which are inhuman and degrading. So we have a number of instruments uh, to once. The, the, the refugees and migrants are there to, uh, to overlook and monitor whether human rights and, 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 uh, and uh, convention provisions are, um, are put in place. So I really hope that altogether we will advance uh, in the area and that this terrible crisis that has happened will help shape better and more coordinated uh, migration, migration policies uh, in throughout the legal space of the Council of Europe. Thank you very much. Secretary General, I know that you're under extreme time pressure, so I'm going to put a last question to, to Minister Coveney. And if you need to leave us to, to catch your plane, thank you so yes. much for joining us and uh, safe travels. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to work with Simon, the team, and everyone next six years, six Thanks, months. Maria. We'll Thank you very much. Thanks see you in Turin. Bye. Minister, may I just put one final question, which is which yeah, is for our audience um, uh, in, in the time you have left. Um, the, the simultaneous um, Committee of Ministers Presidency of the Council of Europe and the membership of the UN Security Council, for which Ireland has received, of course, much praise, uh, does seem like a unique opportunity. How do you believe Ireland can maximize the, the synergy between these, these two presidencies? Gosh, well, work really hard. That's the first thing. <laughs> and and uh, that's what we've been trying to do on the Security Council. You know, we haven't been quiet. It's, uh, there are many times when it would have been easier for us to just say nothing. Um, when we have highlighted uh, conflict and what we regard as breaches in international law uh, that need, need to be accountable to the Security Council. Um, probably Ethiopia was the best example of that when Ireland was essentially screaming stop that there were you know there was um, extraordinary suffering and, and conflict happening uh, and it wasn't getting the attention that was merited or needed in our view uh, and we used the security council to to really focus on that conflict and uh, and other countries joined us in that i'm glad to say uh, but there have been many other examples too so you know really i think this is this is about consistency and credibility so you know ireland is uh, is a country that has credibility in certain areas and they're the areas that we like to focus if we start lecturing other countries on military interventions you know it's not the space where ireland is credible you know we are credible on peacekeeping uh we're certainly not credible on advising ukraine in terms of you know the arms that they need to to acquire and so on so where we are credible is on human rights uh on on gender uh, on development and education, uh, uh, and in certain geographical parts of the world, whether it's the Middle East uh, or parts of Africa, where we've had a presence for many, many years. Uh, and of course, um, uh, in terms of peace interventions, post-conflict management, uh, humanitarian assistance. You know, these are the sort of niche areas that are really important areas where Ireland has focused our effort in the Security Council. So trying to prevent conflicts, trying to respond to ending conflicts and post-conflict accountability when, when state and non-state actors have, have broken international law or conventions. Uh, and you know, that means sometimes saying difficult things, sometimes to countries that we have good relationships with, but that's what we campaigned to be on the Security Council for. Uh, and we got the support of a lot of very small countries around the world that wanted Ireland to be their voice uh, around the Security Council table where huge decisions are discussed and, and sometimes unfortunately not made because of the abuse of some countries uh, of the use of the veto. Um, we're also, I think, increasingly credible on climate uh, and climate policy internationally, um, but we need to, to make sure that, we've, uh, you know, that we deliver ourselves at home uh, while at the same time um, uh, talking to other countries about what needs to be done. And so I think we will try and bring the same approach to the, to the Council of Europe to, to focus on the areas where we have credibility, where, where I can speak both off the record and on the record to other ministers to try and build consensus 
uh, around uh, ways forward or interventions uh, that are relevant to the work that the Council of Europe does. We've also got, I think, 12 uh, separate conferences that we're hosting here in Ireland in different areas linked to the, those three themes, you know, of sort of the founding values of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the Council of Europe, um, uh, youth participation, um, uh, and, uh, and of course, this, this broader area of, of welcomes and migration and how the European Union manages that. So, you know, I think a lot of this is work rate, to be honest. Uh, I'm really lucky that in the Department of Foreign Affairs and to a certain extent in the Department of Defence too, we have people who are genuinely energised by this kind of work. Uh, uh, at home and uh, and in particular abroad, uh, and that's why you know I'm really looking forward to to meeting the ministers of the Council of Europe in in Turin uh, in a couple of weeks' time, and to I think trying to ensure that Ireland is seen as a, a as a serious chair of those discussions, um, uh, and focusing on the issues that are relevant uh, and where 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 we're credible. But like, make no mistake. The next six months is going to be all about Ukraine um, and it's the war there and its consequences, uh, both legal, human, military and political. Um, you know, it is an unfolding human tragedy on, an, on a massive, massive scale. Um, and, uh, and we need to find ways of using all of the bodies that we happen to be sitting on and we happen to have the privilege of having leadership positions on at the moment. Uh, to the greatest extent possible um, to ensure that that Ireland, as small and all as we are, uh, has a has a strong and credible voice that can that can be a catalyst for change. But the final thing I'd say is that what we are good at generally uh, in international politics is bringing people together, you know, and taking views that that involve compromise uh, and and then trying to be as persuasive as we can be to build sort of coalitions of effort. Around, uh, around some of the work that we're doing. Uh, and we'll take that kind of approach here now as well. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky to be working with uh, Marie, actually. I know her very well from when she was uh, foreign minister uh, and deputy prime minister in, uh, in Croatia. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with her and her team. She was in Dublin a few days ago uh, to, uh, to plan the six months ahead. And um, uh, you know, we'll, we certainly won't be found wanting in terms of effort. Um, and uh, uh, building consensus in the Council of Europe isn't easy, actually, because there are a lot of very different perspectives. It's much broader than the European Union, um, but I think um, I think we'll certainly give it a give it a go uh, and uh, try and be as impactful as we can be over the six month period that we have uh, in the chair. Well, that's uh, you have a challenging agenda uh, uh, and a busy one uh, at a historic time in Europe. We wish you every success with that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, thank you so much, Minister, for joining us for this. It's going to be, it's going to be a busy summer. Yes, <laughs> um, I don't on think the you'll be... Council, uh, on the uh, on the Council of Europe within the EU, and it looks like in Northern Ireland too. So, yes, right. uh, and, uh, you know, anybody who says that um, that foreign affairs is a kind of a calm, easy brief, uh, I can tell you, it's um, we're getting um, we're getting a, a series of challenges that that you normally wouldn't get in four or five decades. Uh, in the space now of uh, uh, of a short number of months, but um, but it's um, uh, uh, it's something that I that I think we're equipped uh, to take on uh, and uh, and be credible on. I'm I'm, I'm sure, Minister, uh, given what you've achieved so far, you will rise to that challenge. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, thank you to all uh, who listened and watched. Uh, and thank you, of course, to the Secretary General uh, uh, for her contribution. Uh, uh, and uh, I now will close this session. Thank you.